start. Um, it is recording. Also, I am streaming my voice. Can you speak for a moment? Testing one, two, three. Yep, that's uh, looking good. Okay. All right. And uh, great. Great. We like when we have both of us. Yeah. Being cool. Heard. Yeah. Please, like your first one yesterday, you couldn't hear Carter. I said, I know. <laughs> I said, but we deleted it, so it's not online anymore. <laughs> yeah. Who 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 pointed that out? Clay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Girl. Yesterday was. Mm. Difficult. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm I'm with you. It's been a challenging day mm -hmm. to say the least. Yeah. But what are you gonna do? Oh, did I do something? Hold on, let me check. Um, the problem with OBS. It's not a problem. It's just stupidity, but. Um, I look at it sometimes and I try to navigate in it. That's not a good idea. <laughs> right. So, that's why God created two screens. So. <laughs> oh, let's see. Okay, still, there we go. Now I got gotcha. you. Great. We're live. All right, excellent. Um, well, um, welcome um, to um, today's Open Space Show um, here with uh, the Illuminati. Um, pardon me for just eating a little bit. And also um, just to uh, have a little bit of a drink. I am Carter Emart, and I'm the Director of Astro Visualization of the American Museum of Natural History, um, which yeah, it's an academic collaboration um, uh, with uh, three universities uh, to create Open Space. Open Space is a NASA Science Mission Directorate supported uh, open source, freely available software from our website, openspaceproject.com. Um, the software is available in Windows, Mac OS, and also a Linux build. Uh, I mentioned this is a uh, collaboration with uh, uh, multiple uh, members. Uh, and so uh, most notably, uh, the American Museum of Natural History has collaborated um, for um, about 20 years uh, on um, data visualization, uh, which was uh, the basis of creating a, a sort of big 3D model of the universe um, when, uh, when we decided to um, renovate the Hayden Planetarium and go from stars on the ceiling um, to essentially use gaming technology, uh, fast graphics cards, uh, to really paint a large picture of the universe. If I was to show you this just in brief as a form of introduction, let me do this. I'll pull away from the Earth. I'll bring up um, the orbit, orbital trails of Earth. Uh, we saw the moon there. Now we see the inner solar system and on out into the stars. And uh, so I'll just let that um, proceed. And we now are seeing the stars come off the sort of wallpaper backdrop of the sky uh, into three dimensions. And um, so uh, we have in this case, the Hipparcos Star Database. We're also working with the uh, Gaia mission currently. Um, we have locators that I'm not just bringing up in this very quick uh, zoom out of uh, uh, now the Milky Way galaxy. This is actually from a constrained simulation. Our colleagues in Japan that we had visualized in New York for production. And if I pull out really fast, uh, I always say, okay, there's a little glitch there. Um, but now we're seeing the extragalactic space around our Milky Way. The local group of just uh, really a few members uh, um, in close to us. We're the one in the center. Uh, um, every dot you're seeing now is sort of a major galaxy. We showed uh, some of our smaller companions as we moved out. But right now uh, we're seeing the large scale structure um, uh, from Brent Tully's catalog of uh, extragalactic survey, about 30,000 galaxies reaching out to a few hundred million light years. The biggest sort of knot in our neighborhood uh, or uh, 
um, grouping of galaxies is the Virgo cluster, um, passing sort of uh, in foreground now. Um, we're still rotating around the Earth. And if I pull out farther, um, we'll see uh, uh, surveys that uh, are not complete in the sense of uh, the, the full picture. In this, in this case, this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, from Apache Point, uh, New Mexico, which favored, uh, of course, in the, being in the uh, northern hemisphere, northern hemispheric uh, view of the, uh, of, of the galaxies we see on the right side. Uh, less galaxies in what was its southern view, and then this cleft uh, in the middle, which is really uh, where our Milky Way kind of blocks the view of uh, uh, a clear view of very dim galaxies, so very uh, far distance. Distance, of course, is uh, um, sort of a uh, metric with velocity, um, given the expansion of the universe. Um, coming out farther, we'll see uh, the Sloan's Associated Quasar Survey um, and then also uh, beyond that, uh, the cosmic microwave background imaged by uh, the Planck satellite. All of these data sets are co-registered uh, together um, to form what we call um, and had put together 20 years ago and been evolving, of course, because some of these data sets are newer. Um, what we call at the museum, uh, the Digital Universe 3D Atlas of data. Um, I wanted to concentrate uh, on uh, topics, however, of planetary science, given the nature of this particular conference. And um, so the digital universe you can think of as this kind of um, grand uh, overarching set of um, material. Uh, as I come back now down into from that Milky Way galaxy that we saw, I mentioned it was a constrained simulation from colleagues in Japan that... Uh, uh, we later developed even further um, at the um, Rose Center, uh, part of the American Museum of, of uh, Natural History in New York. Um, we have a department of astrophysics. Uh, one of our astrophysicists uh, um, is uh, a, a big part of any production that we have. And so uh, working with our technical director and so on, we worked uh, developed uh, the um, Milky Way uh, model, um, and that, that uh, um, that's in there, and then w underneath that are the, the subsets of data, that, well, data sets that we have, which are a subset of the Milky Way, of course, um, uh, of what is primarily um, surrounding um, close to us for the stars, um, but then star clusters, other objects that we see across the galaxy are also in there. So I'm just going to come back uh, briefly uh, to Earth. Uh, as we uh, come up close, we can see, um, maybe I'll attempt to brighten uh, the orbit of the moon, quarter million miles out. Uh, now we see um, the uh, uh, trails of the uh, other planets. Um, north is currently down, uh, so I'm going to rotate our view and come up on the trail uh, that leads to Earth. Earth has one satellite that uh, we're showing right now. That's the International Space Station. Um, but to talk just about uh, how we are actually, uh, within open space, exploring planetary worlds um, is to look at, um, at the planets uh, from a globe browsing perspective. So um, uh, various uh, uh, data that are out there. We use um, uh, the geo... Um, a spatial data abstraction language, GDAL, to actually uh, um, uh, represent our globes. Um, and then our data sets are, are multiple. In this case, uh, what we are seeing is um, a daily image uh, that's uh, brought to us by NASA's observing system, in this case, the SIMI NPP satellite, uh, the VERS instrument. Uh, I get sound about uh, it's giving us in true color. Uh, a, a view a global mosaic every day um, down to half a kilometer in resolution. Um, beyond that, um, I won't bore us with uh, looking at the Earth, but, but uh, we, we can go down close to the Earth um, with ESRI's uh, uh, high resolution service, which is global. Um, and uh, also of note here is a Rayleigh and Me scattering atmosphere is physics based. Um, must, uh, much of what has gone into um, 
the development efforts in open space have been through student projects with Linköping University in Sweden that has been our primary um, uh, collaborator that uh, we began working with about, you know, about 20 years ago. And um, we, when we received NASA funding in 2015 to develop further, that uh, brought in as well um, the University of Utah's Scientific Computing and, and Imaging Institute, um, arguably the world's largest data visualization research facility, also New York University's uh, Tandon School of Engineering. And um, so between the museum and um, Sweden and two universities, we are four. Um, the developments uh, that have led to such as Glow Browsing uh, are all documented in papers and can um, be looked at on a wiki that we have. Uh, so the, uh, the basis of this and also the uh, covering the scales that we just saw that uh, Open Space operates on um, basically choosing a center of interest and then um, getting closer and closer um, to whatever objects that we may want to put together. So this is really a sort of a context engine to uh, view multiple different data sets, visualize them all together with the latest graphics card technology. If you want to think of it as gaming sort of technology, it allows us to do that. Um, also, um, just uh, I've been showing a static view of the universe so far, but if I bring up satellites here and and uh, maybe I'll, I'll start time going a little faster. If I bring up an interface, I can see this is five minutes per second. We can see uh, rapidly moving around the Earth now um, in concert with that one orbit I'd shown of the ISS um, that uh, we see uh, low Earth orbiting satellites. We're not showing all of the satellites here. It's just a select few. And then on out to geosynchronous. Um, about uh, one-tenth the distance, uh, of course, from the moon. So let's, uh, for a moment, uh, in fact, uh, what I'm running in an offline mode, so we see a little bit of white here that's progressing. Um, I, it just uh, our internet difficulties yesterday led me to run in an offline mode. But uh, if, I, if I come close, this would fill in with the data from NASA Gibbs. It goes down to a half a kilometer in resolution. Okay. Fine. I'm going to sort of stop the clock for a moment and um, now choose uh, the moon. So I'll just come down, I'll move over um, to moon. And when I do, it's uh, of course near, uh, it's just an early crescent phase of the moon currently. Um, but uh, if I uh, do the following, I'm just going to sort of uh, ignore uh, shading so that we see sort of everything turned on at once in this case. And uh, as I get closer, um, I'm going to zoom in on Apollo 17. I want to turn that label of Mars off. And uh, so let me do that. Uh, my Mars label off. And so now as, as uh, we come in, um, we're looking at, uh, at the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter's Wide Angle Camera and Global Mosaic. Um, but then we can augment... Uh, with greater and greater detail, um, additional data products. Um, to look at Apollo 17, we're coming in on um, a uh, close-up from a, an LROC narrow-angle camera mosaic that was nicely done by Haas et al. from uh, the collaboration between the USGS and the German DLR. So we're coming in a little hot on this. It's just it's loading a number of different uh, data sets. Um, over on the left, we see South Massif, and um, so I'm coming up now on uh, um, uh, Apollo 17's Station 6 uh, split rock boulder that came rolled down North Massif, and um, so I'm just going to I'm just going to try to um, go to Moon. There's a level of detail. Um, sliders and sometimes I just have to kind of tickle that a little bit to uh, make it respond to make everything uh, load in concert. Um, as we get closer we can see um, again the LROC mosaic that's been nicely augmented um, by, uh, uh, by this um, data set available from USGS and I may just uh, um, once again sort of hit the 
level of detail indicator. Make sure I have everything together. Uh, as we get close, um, I'll just, I want to highlight um, here for a second uh, um, some photogrammetry that was done uh, by uh, some high school interns of ours at the Museum of Natural History um, using uh, the Apollo Hasselblad uh, uh, photography taken uh, on EVA by Jack Schmidt and Gene Cernan. And so we're coming up on... Um, on uh, boulders one, two, three, four, and five. And uh, they're using reality capture software. Obviously, there are holes of where we were not able to get more information. Um, but their, um, their imagery was complete enough in working with um, a modern photogrammetry package like reality capture. It's, it's quite extraordinary that we can get down um, very close uh, up to um, the... Uh, the boulders here, and uh, in some cases, uh, identify where certain samples uh, were actually taken and brought back uh, um, uh, to the Lunar Receiving Lab. Uh, but um, actually, I just want to sort of, um, I have friction that I have sort of turned off, so it allows me to sort of glide in and out, but I'm, I'm, act, I'm actively driving this with my mouse, uh, which is, you know, it's a uh, developed technique um, it's fairly straightforward in so far as navigating, but a three-button mouse works pretty well with it. Um, so I just wanted to come over here. We can actually see Jack Schmidt's uh, footprints. I actually showed this at uh, LPSC uh, two years ago. Uh, we were also presenting um, with our colleagues uh, at the Illuminati. Um, who we're presenting with today. And um, so let me just freeze this motion and just... Um, pan about so that we can actually appreciate here, actually in in the in the shade, um, that uh, the vesicular nature of, of the boulder here, which was somewhat different from the uh, um, uh, the boulders uh, just uh, uphill from it, and um, there's also there's a contact in here that's talked about in the science report and so forth. But in this way, we can actually sort of really sort of explore that. Um, we only had coverage really on the sunlit side. So like a stage set, uh, <laughs> there is um, a lack of detail on the other side of it. If I pull back, it would sort of reveal um, that uh, it's only coverage it's, uh, of what we have. Um, and then also uh, now I'll just uh, focus for a second on uh, to come up to uh, gain a, a, a sort of higher view. What I'll do is um, bring my menus back. And um, just uh, go here to um, the Apollo 17 uh, LEM Challenger, and we'll, we'll uh, fly over to it. Um, in fact, I think the way... Oh, I have a little problem. It shouldn't be flying up here. <laughs> should be down on the surface. So um, I think that is... Uh, when I loaded the height map, uh, it was a bit of a glitch. But nevertheless, we, we can see uh, across uh, uh, Apollo 17's um, uh, rover uh, traversals. And uh, we also have boulders um, for stations 2, 6, 7, and 8, I believe, um, that we've done photogrammetry for. Um, let's uh, pull out to... Um, uh, just globally here um, to uh, see the broader uh, moon. And um, I was going to fly off to Mars. I'm not sure if there are any questions that are coming in. And um, so I might not ask Adam that. if, if uh, he's seeing anything out there. I haven't seen any questions yet, but okay. I have sent a message out saying that if they have questions, let us know. Also, if they have anywhere they'd like to visit, let us know and we can try to accommodate. Great. So I'm just going to pull out um, here uh, from the moon and uh, just change our focus uh, to Mars. Uh, we still have the uh, uh, satellites around Earth turned on, so um, I'll turn those off. Um, just uh, recenter on what, what we choose to do. 
and uh, off to Mars. Now, I should mention that this was developed primarily as a visualization for planetariums. Um, and so in our NASA funding uh, from uh, SMD, uh, we're part of what's called the Science Activation Group, about 25 um, groups that were funded, uh, some actually within NASA itself, uh, but museums and, and uh, other institutions um, that um, uh, were chosen for their educational uh, outreach and potential. And uh, so uh, we have actually a number of partners of uh, uh, some of the, the largest planetariums uh, across the U.S., the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, Morrison uh, Planetarium at the California Academy of Sciences, Gates Planetarium in uh, uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, uh, Burke Baker Planetarium in Houston uh, at the uh, Museum of, of Nature and Science, and then Museum of Natural Sciences in um, in in Raleigh, North Carolina, where they don't actually have a planetarium, uh, but Rachel Smith is... Uh, um, attending LPSC uh, uh, was uh, at our poster with uh, Marina Gemma, our, our um, graduate student at the, at the museum, uh, representing that poster when I was presenting yesterday. Okay, coming up on Mars, um, let me see Themos and Phobos. I'm going to clear the trails away. Um, at first, what we have is really just a, um, a somewhat low resolution compared to what I'm going to show you. Um, Mars that's uh, from the uh, Mars Global Surveyor Wide Angle Camera. And uh, we actually uh, were attempting to get all shadows out so that, that we wanted sort of a, um, a high phase angle, you know, um, noon lighting everywhere. So we actually divided the image by a hill shape uh, from MOLA uh, terrain. And uh, the goal here was to get color and tonality that we would use to then um, colorize um, other maps. So now if I just uh, add in the Viking mosaic, uh, the Viking mosaic has a uh, certain tonality that um, uh, was different from the colors that we were concerned with for uh, production efforts at the museum. So if I just come down here now and, and uh, uh, open up our image layers uh, here labeled as color layers, but they're not all colors and they're monochromatic is if I turn off the mock color, we see now just the Viking mosaic, <clears throat> um, but we also have uh, the Rayleigh and me scattering atmosphere on this, which is giving additional color. And um, so to bring this uh, better together, we're actually um, bringing the color uh, that, that we give for, for global color into this, um, uh, just uh, taking the hue from that. So as we get closer to the Viking image, what I would like to do is, um, is, is now switch over to Murray Labs, uh, Jay Dixon's work with the CTX Global Mosaic. Um, he has shared with us, this is a, sort of a, a beta version of this where it still has uh, latitudinal um, contrasts. Um, and, of course, he had to do a tremendous amount of contrast adjustment to blend these images. And we can also see in the north-south trending direction um, where there are holes essentially down to the image underneath it, which is the Viking mosaic. Um, if we were to fly along uh, Noctis Labyrinthus, um, uh, I'll just uh, allow us to come down to some details that I'd like to show. And um, so... Uh, getting a little closer, um, I'm now going to uh, emphasize which um, elevation maps we're using. So over on the uh, on the left, uh, we can see uh, what we have: a number of different elevation products, um, some local through say the Jezero landing site, um, and also um, we are sourcing um, thanks to Esri uh, company. Um, which gives us our high-resolution Earth, is also serving this uh, global CTX map um, from Dixon. In addition to the high-rise, actually, um, the high-rise uh, that was a full set uh, was posted on the high-rise site up till about a year and a half ago, so there's more data coming in. But also, we have all the, um, the local set is basically uh, the, the ones that... that uh, 
um, have associated um, terrains. Um, so that's, uh, that's a, a lesser number. Um, so we'll see some of that in a moment. Um, but we are actually using here uh, uh, the high resolution stereo camera and MOLA um, elevation um, um, currently. And that was processed by Trent here um, at, um, as a singular data set uh, at USGS. Um, and so flying over um, the western extent of Alice Marineris um, and uh, Ias Chasma and um, Tithonium and uh, on our way to um, Candor. And I'm going to come into Western Candor slowly here. And I think I have my associated layers. I just want to make sure um, that, uh, let's just make sure I have all of that. Yeah, I think that should be good. And uh, in this way, um, we can now see a non-vertically exaggerated uh, view. Um, you may see the stars through the atmosphere. That's uh, something that we're currently working on. Uh, uh, it should fade out as we get closer, but I may have to do that manually. Um, but uh, here we are seeing uh, the uh, collapsed... Uh, um, uh, a Graben feature leading into Candor and uh, Seti Mensa here, uh, layered deposits, um, uh, some nearly 20,000 feet uh, down into the canyon. Uh, we can see one of the high rise patches um, currently that I have just uh, tone wise a little bit lighter so that we can sort of call it out uh, that we're approaching. I'm not capturing my cursor, which is probably a, a, a good decision because otherwise you'd see my cursor zooming around, but then I could point out features. Um, so as we come up uh, on um, on the canyon, uh, let's let's uh, drop on down. Now I mentioned that uh, we were using a, uh, a global um, a MOLA high resolution stereo camera. Uh, result, um, I will now just come into the um, uh, stereo uh, elevation model uh, for high rise, um, as done by um, stereo uh, analysis here using socket set. Um, and once again, no vertical exaggeration. A few hundred meters of the tallest uh, objects here, um, and then of course in the background, a few. Um, thousand meters in, in uh, elevation. Um, the crinolated um, sulfate layers here, and um, then the yarding um, uh, wind erosion in, in these features, again, scale of one to one. Uh, what's nice here uh, is just coming down uh, from, well, where we started, <laughs> perhaps, uh, uh, we started from Earth, we went out to the Cosmic microwave background, we came back, went to the moon, and now we're at Mars, um, all sort of in one session. Um, here we see the uh, layers, but also cutting across the layers, we see sand dune deposits um, and uh, um, in this terrain, which is uh, exactly where you would not want to land a rover. At least uh, maybe we're getting better with our optical navigation now after uh, landing Perseverance. Uh, maybe we get bold and, and send a, a rover here some, someday before, uh, uh, we, someday while I'm still alive, hopefully. Uh, although this is truly a tremendous uh, landscape to see. If I just uh, um, tip up, oh, we see the stars. I can go turn off the stars. Uh, our menu is such that uh, there are many items in here, but if I just search stars and turn them off, there they go. You know, still see the Milky Way a little bit. Okay. Um, I wanted to point out, actually, um, I want to get a higher sun here. You can see the sun is getting kind of low. So um, if I just uh, come up, whoops. Um, let me, I'll close the menu item. I'll, I'll pull the uh, clock up, and I, I need to sort of go back an hour or so. Oh, there, I'm just pointing out where Earth is. Um, so anyway, uh, at this point, uh, uh, I'll just clear this. I want to just show uh, that our high school student interns at, um, at AM&H are using the AIM Stereo Pipeline 
to augment the data that we have. So we're, in this case, I'll bring up a CTX map that was done two years ago. Um, so let's bring that up um, in my elevation products over here. So not my color layers, but my height layers. And uh, so let's turn on um, Pandora uh, 2019, Western Candor. Um, one of the, uh, uh, the students who had worked on this, um, happy to say, proud to say that uh, um, she's now pursuing her PhD at, uh, at the University of Hawaii, and that's uh, Kiara Ferrari Wong, who I don't know if she's possibly even watching right now. Um, so uh, there's also, let me just check this against this other one, which I think was more limited in extent. Oh, that doesn't look good. So let me go back to this one. So as this loads, this, this is a uh, this is actually a fairly sizable map to load, but it will go from um, basically a 200 meter resolution global for um, the high resolution stereo camera, which is better than MOLA in this in this particular area, um, but gets us down to about 20 meters. Um, in this case, uh, the high rise, of course, um, we have a, a much higher resolution really 25 centimeter resolution to start off with. And so our elevation uh, product is, uh, is, is quite astounding where we, where we have those. Um, also, uh, if I was to bring up um, the high rise that uh, are also served, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, that are served by Esri. Let's open up uh, color layers here. And, um, invoke the high rise, uh, we'll see some of those. And um, suffice to say that uh, the image resolution is here um, on these, uh, but uh, um, the uh, elevation product uh, that we're looking at is this uh, CTX derived. I think it's, it's stuttering a little bit just because it's, it's uh, attempting to load that and everything else and share this over the internet. So, all right. So just coming a little bit into Northwest Candor uh, and uh, swinging around, we can see the landslides coming off the canyon walls. Uh, we see the layered deposits uh, in the center. Um, and, um, and then also we are seeing our um, really me scattering atmosphere. Okay. Um, Gonna come up a little higher here. How are we doing for uh, time, Adam? I'll just uh, ask that and see if there are any questions. About 20 minutes, and uh, uh, we do have a question. Are there any favorite moons we could visit? Oh, um, yes. In fact, uh, I, I'm sort of embarrassed. I, I, I uh, anticipated that question for... Um, Phobos, and I meant to actually put in uh, Demos and Phobos, and uh, um, I, I did not. So in this particular session, there we have it and you can load it. Um, it's sort of a question of how much you might want to load. Um, also, if I reloaded open space, I might be able to show uh, that we have all the asteroids. Um, we have uh, them as uh, point data. Um, but um, as, as also, uh, whereas we have tremendous resolution for Mars and these, these various uh, uh, layered data sets, um, for other moons, like, well, I, perhaps I could show Titan. Um, and in which case, I would, I would reload, uh, just because um, uh, in this case, I had sort of attempted to cache my presentation uh, because I was, we were having some internet issues. Yes, we did. Um, uh, Titan, I, I find uh, uh, really, uh, it's, it's a nice set of data sets between the radar and uh, infrared. Um, seeing through, um, you know, uh, essentially clouds uh, and, and haze. Um, and also with Venus, so, of course, uh, using the SAR imaging. Uh, similar to uh, the radar that we got from the high-gain antenna. I'm guessing. 
Um, I'm coming into this particular area um, because my colleagues that are space artists, uh, space painters, I'm, I'm a space artist myself, I suppose, um, but um, had always, uh, you know, there was a fondness for showing people climbing on the uh, cliffs of uh, Valles Marineris. So in fact, uh, much of it is our, our slopes that uh, um, might be fairly, you know, easy to uh, walk down, perhaps, if not up. Um, but in this case, this very fresh sort of rock face um, with obvious cliffs is uh, really quite a dramatic sight. Uh, when, when we started exploring around, uh, once we had all the uh, uh, high-rise, ele- uh, all the high-rise um, examples that had associated elevation uh, models with them, this one really stood out. And uh, it's, I love this this little spire in here. If a if a, uh, if a flying squirrel um, outfit would work on uh, Mars, this would be a place where you could go bombing through, perhaps. Um, not much atmosphere to, to do that. You can see behind this actually um, kind of a wall between the high rise. Um, I, we're, we're seeing it, so I might as well just talk to you a little bit. Uh, and what we're seeing here is a difference between the elevation map uh, of high rise against uh, the MOLA HRSC uh, map um, adjacent to it. And then we can, we can adjust that. I can slide the map up and down, but we, we generally normalize it to an average um, to that of MOLA. And so here we have this one sticking up um, a little bit um, with respect to the surrounds. So this, uh, again, it's, it's data, edges of data that uh, um, one confronts. There's um, one of my favorite places uh, to, to, to see uh, other than this one. Um, I had seen pictures of it a long time, uh, and uh, it was targeted by high-rise. Boy, I, I, I just, um, I, I think I'm just flying a little too fast that, it's, that it stutters. But um, uh, if you don't mind, uh, maybe I'll take you to a couple favorite spots. Uh, one is in Ganges, um, but uh, Juventi um, uh, actually has um, a tiny little spot. I call it Secret Valley because it's sort of uh, separated from uh, the main uh, chasma, where we have the layered deposits that are sort of dead ahead. Uh, um, that we might see, but over on the left uh, is is a place that's rather special. So um, the light toned uh, layered deposits. Uh, I'm turning att- our attention away from actually um, for the moment, and uh, we'll just uh, come in here um, a little closer to this um, where the where the canyon uh, tops off, and we have this this interesting. Um, set of layers uh, in here, and then we'll drop into that that little um, uh, that little valley just off to uh, just beyond us to the left. And the high rise, we have a nice um, targeted high rise that goes right down the middle, and so. And, uh, I guess a, a very degraded crater and then a series of uh, layers eroded away and sand dunes, but um, it's a very sort of picturesque little spot down here. So I'll just come on down to show you all. Um, while we have um, all the high rise, I, I, I'm fairly familiar with most of them at this point. Um, but certain ones really stand out. So that's why I, I just sort of wanted to, if you indulge me, I'd sort of show you a couple of these sites, which are, are, are pretty amazing. I think if uh, I was building my own dome on uh, Mars, it might be somewhere in this valley. So 
So Adam, I, again, I'm not sure if anybody <laughs> else has some questions. I feel like that I punted on the uh, on, on the, the one about the moon. So I, I'm, I'm sorry. And I, actually, I think for tomorrow, if you want to come back, I, I think I'll, I'll load our moons that we have so that I might be able to show that. That's all right, because Open Space was the person who asked about any favorite moons. Oh, boy. Do. OK. So, I think I know uh, who that is. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> so, uh, you know, to be honest, I would say probably five to ten more minutes and then probably wrap up. Uh, so maybe sure. just do a couple of your favorite, you know, sites and yeah. and uh, and then we'll wrap up for today. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I think uh, session at 3.30. And then also, of course, with the landing at uh, Jezero, I, I think uh, what I'll do is, is head out over there. But if I just back up for this, I, I just I, I think aesthetically pleasing here, the way the the uh, uh, the sands, it, 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 you know, I mean, Mars, if if anything, it's, it's just a sort of a sculptural wonderland, uh, given its thin atmosphere, but its ability to move the sand dunes around um, the layers that are exposed. I mean, it, it really is uh, if you're if um, you're a fan of uh, hiking around the southwest. Um, this is a planet that uh, would certainly satisfy. Um, so anyway, let's uh, let's move up and away from here. And oh yes, I was going to show you the Ganges Light Tone Mounds. Uh, so let me do that. Oh boy. I don't like how it's stuttering, but uh, what's happening is I, I really am uh, flying fast and furious here um, for um, my laptop. <laughs> it's an Alienware laptop. It's a few years old. Um, uh, but uh, when we run this in a planetarium, we usually have a cluster of six or more um, computers uh, matched to projectors. And, uh, and so... Um, the net effect is that, uh, you know, this is surrounding you and it really seems like you're in a giant flight simulator. This particular uh, set of light tone mounds, uh, um, perhaps, you know, cell phases, perhaps gypsum mountains, if you will, if, it, if I may be so bold. But uh, anyway, that, that uh, we, we see this, this, this beautiful uh, sort of wake dune around the the front of this from the winds coming in uh, from just beyond here, um, and raking across these features and sculpting them. Um, uh, my friend Jeff Moore um, from NASA Ames, uh, we, we gave a talk together um, at uh, the California Academy of Sciences Mars and Planetarium a couple of years ago. Um, and um, um, the, the uh, one of the dean lectures there, and uh, so we, we did a little measurement of this feature here, and um, like I, I've been sort of calling it the uh, Martian half dome, and it is roughly the scale of half dome in Yosemite. Um, so what we see here, and uh, in this case, just a, a tremendous. Um, sculptural set of forms and great alluvial fans coming off them. Um, beautiful sand dunes just over that hill uh, in the background. Uh, um, beautiful to see in sculptural form and uh, from the high-rise um, uh, camera's perspective. Um, there are also these other light tone features uh, covered by high-rise, but uh, not with uh, elevation. Now, um, we see a drop-off uh, um, I'm going to silence that, uh, which is because I have a regional map on the other side. So what I'm going to do is uh, turn that off and make sure that I have my elevation map open. And uh, so there we go. And so that, that uh, will just basically if I have a regional map for uh, CTX 20 meter resolution, uh, we basically um, handle that as a quadrant or an octant on Mars. 
um, and uh, to reduce having the full global map everywhere else. But one can toggle it. These are details. Um, Aries Vallis, uh, let's just, uh, as I back off here, I turn the stars off, and then it's kind of accurate in the sense of what you might see uh, from a spacecraft. Um, but now let's uh, actually uh, roll Mars back in time here a bit. Let's see. And proceed over to Jezero. And there we see Sirtis and Isidus. Um, so let's come in. Um, and here I invoke actually, what I'll do as I come a little closer is let's turn off um, the global. Whoops, I'm going to keep that on. I want to turn off the global CTX. Um, so then we see this is the Viking image, you know, just uh, highlight, highlighting that again. And that's great to uh, a certain uh, range and detail. Um, also, I have all the high rise uh, turned on. I'm just going to leave the high rise um, that uh, that might have been slowing me down actually, because um, it was just that much more data. But I, now I'm I'm I'm, I'm coming up on uh, Murray Labs uh, again. Jay Dixon's uh, work here of just of the region surrounding Jezero, Northeast Sirtis. Um, and uh, on up to Nili Fossi. Um, let me uh, tip our camera as we come in. Um, one can just see the slight footprints, perhaps, uh, hopefully in the screen share, um, of the high-rise footprints uh, that we can see that do have elevation modeling. And so as we approach um, the Perseverance landing site, Give you a Butler landing site uh, that um, we oh I there's one more uh, map I, I elevation map I want to turn on um, and uh, so let's do that uh, and that is for the Jezero region and there you now it's just adjusting and so that that renders a a much finer resolution uh, version of the crater rim and the surrounds uh, where we don't have elevation modeling such as we do with uh, um, for for high rise. Uh, this is much better than the global HRSC uh, product of, again um, prepared by the USGS. So as, as we come down here we can see the landing site uh, just to the right. Uh, there's a little bit of a glitch as we come through a certain altitude. That's I, I'm informed that that's already fixed by our developers. Um, but uh, now let's uh, um, just uh, sort of, uh, I think from this perspective, and uh, I mean, we're getting a lot of fly arounds now and movies and so forth prepared. Um, but I want to emphasize that what Open Space is doing is contextualizing Yes, the foreground in high resolution, but also the background so that we can see, once again, with the CTX elevation, um, the uh, uh, basically the road cut <laughs> of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the channel coming through, uh, flooding um, the lake here, which uh, uh, was potentially as deep as Lake Michigan, which is interesting, I think is kind of a, an analog to talk about uh, when... Um, citing how, how, how deep that uh, this crater was. And this particular knob um, uh, that uh, does not yet have a name, I, I don't believe. Uh, I don't think anyone has named it yet, but can clearly be seen uh, from uh, the, uh, um, uh, the panoramas taken by Perseverance. I like to call it uh, Mount Marvin from Marvin the Martian, but uh, <laughs> who cares what I think? But nevertheless, um, it's nice that... Uh, you can come over and, and see details down to the boulders. Um, just quickly, I want to come up to um, the uh, area around Belva that, uh, with the exposed uh, layers, which um, at least seem to be on uh, certainly one of the objectives uh, to get over here um, on, uh, on, on these layers. And it's interesting just to see contextually um, how these sort of cross-bedded features uh, from the delta 
are exposed uh, there. They're, they're sort of sanded away on, on the surface. But in Belva itself, uh, we, we can actually see uh, the cross bedding exposed in the layering uh, uh, that uh, um, from the impact um, right here. So it's, it's kind of interesting to, to see uh, those uh, a correlation of, of, of these features, not only from the crater wall, but uh, across the surface of the belt itself. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Just to recap, open space is um, a product from American Museum of Natural History, uh, Linshipping University in Sweden, University of Utah's uh, uh, Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute, and uh, New York University's uh, Tandon School of Engineering. We're part of NASA's Science Activation Program. Uh, from the Science Mission Directorate. Um, and uh, I have a message. My internet's a little unstable, if you can still hear me. Our website uh, that you can go to, openspaceproject.com. You can download this. runs on Windows, runs on Mac, um, runs on uh, Linux. You have to compile yourself in that case. So thank you for your attention. Um, love to get feedback from you guys. Um, and I want to thank the Illuminati for uh, uh, us teaming up on this. Uh, they do innovative uh, uh, display systems all around the world. They, they work with uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the EYES project, as well as many other projects worldwide. Um, and so uh, it's been a pleasure to present to you all today. All right. Thank you so much, Carter. Uh, we're going to go ahead and end the live stream. Again, any of you that would like information on open space, you can visit both openspaceproject.com or illuminati.com and visit our software section. We'd love to help any of you get this implemented into your dome. It's absolutely fabulous. And of course, what don't we love about free 99? So um, the, anybody that has any questions, please reach out. Again, thank you, Carter, for taking time for today's uh, session. We'll be doing another session this afternoon at 3.30 Central Time. Um, and then just kind of heads up for those of you that are tracking our sessions. Uh, we have a special uh, guest presenter tomorrow from 3.30 to 4 o'clock Central Standard Time uh, presenting from my area here in Denver, uh, Colorado. We will uh, have joining us Bob Reynolds and Kachun Yu from uh, Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Uh, Kachun will be driving. But Bob Reynolds will be pre presenting. So uh, we'll be showing that uh, session tomorrow. Again, thanks for joining us. And we look forward to talking to all of you at the conference. Thanks again, Carter. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.